Well, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Ken Manning, Western Wisconsin Video Productions, here with Dana and Gary once again. This is a History Alive project. Thanks to, again, a uh, good shout out to Dave and Ruth Amundsen for their help and support with this project. Well, you two, you're back at it again here at Westby Sitting to My. Uh, thanks for being here once again. Oh, thank you for having us. It's always a pleasure to come up here and see how you guys celebrate this <laughs> <laughs> this event. We're from down near Stoughton where we have mm -hmm. a Setnamai as well. Mm -hmm. So it's it's fun to see another group of yeah. people celebrating. You know, someday we might get down to Stoughton. That's gonna be a huge one, I would imagine. It's good size, yeah. Yes. 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 And Gary, uh, we were kind of talking a little bit ahead of time here. You didn't bring the full outfit today, but that's okay. Yeah, from waist down, we're good. <laughs> yes, the weather's a lot nicer this year than uh, last year, but we really appreciate uh, coming up here again. Dave and Ruth uh, inviting us up here to uh, talk to everyone and talk about our uh, passion of Norwegian genealogy and history and things like that. So um, it's just been a great experience and uh, we hope to come up here for many more years. So thank you very much for inviting us. It's always a blast seeing you two here and that it's, you know, when you get the familiar faces, it just makes you feel that much more comfortable. Well, speaking of comfort, uh, you're going to, Dana, you're going to kind of explain some things to the group that comes in today uh, without giving away the story. But tell us a little bit about the story that you have planned for us today uh, with uh, the different names and how that all came about in that Norwegian culture. Yes, um, I'm going to be talking about Norwegian naming traditions. And that is something that when people start their genealogy journey, it is oftentimes a big hurdle for Americans because the naming customs in Norway in the 1700s and 1800s are very, very different from what we do now. We have a tendency to think of last names as existing in a family and it's just passed on and that's how it works and that was not how things worked in Norway during that time. So it's important to understand how it was different so you don't get lost when you're tracing your family. It sounds to me like I read a little bit about the, uh, the kind of the start of your program and I thought, how in the world can you keep track of all that stuff? There's so many different routes and branches on that tree or however you want to say it. Yes, you just have to get into a different mindset. <laughs> you have to remember that your family wasn't always Anderson. Mm -hmm. And you just have to remember that, that it wasn't like that. <laughs> and that it's okay when fathers and their children have different last names. That's not weird, that's normal, and you just have to embrace that it's, it was different. It's not wrong, it's different. Now, you are pretty much the head uh, in the, I wanna say, are you the head in the state when it comes to stuff like this? Oh, you're nodding your head like I should say, yeah. But <laughs> well, I know, I know. I'm, I'm gonna say yes, because she's my wife, so. Uh... There you go. <laughs> the, the Norwegian American Genealogical Center is the largest a uh, library devoted exclusively to Norwegian American genealogy. Um, we're the largest in the state. We're actually probably the largest in North America that focuses just on that particular ethnic group. So we're very, very fortunate to have a resource so close for people with Norwegian ancestry. So we'd love to see people from Vernon County come down and visit us. We're not that far away. We <laughs> made the drive in one morning to get here in time. So it's, it's not so far. Yeah. Well, I think we're pretty fortunate to have you two here today, again, with the presentation. We appreciate you coming up uh, from that Stoughton region and uh, wish you the best of luck here today and, and also safe travels home when you do decide to head back. Oh, thank you very much. It's really great to be here and we look forward to it every year. All right. Well, Gary and Dana here today with our History Alive project. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed today's program. We're going to turn it over in just a moment, but let's take a quick look at some of our sponsors, and we'll return here with Dana and all the information that she has for us. Thanks for joining us.
Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Peter Crowell. I'm the Royalty Advisor. I'm also Vice President of SITMI. Um, I want to introduce to you our 2022 SITMI Royalty Court, and I'll have them introduce themselves. I'm Bryn Lundstedt. I'm the daughter of Eric and Stephanie Lundstedt, and I'm the Royalty Princess. I'm Marissa Kwong. I'm the first attendant, and my parents are Sam and Jack Kwong. I'm the second attendant, Mara Martini, and my parents are Derek and Kara Martini.
also uh, uh, dairy farms. Um, last year, and I mentioned, even asked them this morning, if they raise whole seeds. Well, I said, last year, maybe you can think about Jersey. He didn't like the last year, so I thought, well, maybe a year, it would change his mind. <laughs> I asked him this morning, no, nope. so we're still working. I'm afraid of anything shorter than me, shorter than me, so that's why I'm really fearful of Ruth. Oh, wow. <laughs> look at that look. Yeah, she's like, comes here, a jersey comes about the same height as Ruth, and I just, <laughs> it just doesn't mix. We'll so, stop the analogies. No, okay. <laughs> And they, they have uh, three children uh, that they also keep them very busy besides farming. And Gary comes along and helps and assists in many of the workshops that uh, Dana does. I have to mention one thing. Yesterday about 1 o'clock, Dana calls us and says, we have a family emergency uh, at a home. What are we going to do? What are we going to do for a backup? But because uh, they were going to come up last night, Instead, uh, they decided to come up this morning, so they've been up for a while. But as Dana said, that's no problem for us because we work harder, so we're used to getting up early. So. Yeah, we did not get up any earlier than normal. <laughs> I did. She did. She did. She did. <laughs> that's about a two and a half, three hour drive to get here, so I very much appreciate your willingness to come. So I'll let you have Dana take over and talk about the, uh, the uh, program. Uh, what's your name, uh -huh. So. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Can you hear me if I don't use the microphone? We're okay? All right. This way I can stand a little closer to my computer and see what I'm going to say. Yeah. Um, so when David Ruth asked me to come up here, they said, can you talk about some of these Norwegian names? Because it can be confusing, and it absolutely is. When people come to the center and start doing their Norwegian genealogy, this whole naming system that the Norwegians used in the 1700s and the 1800s is just so foreign to most Americans, because it is completely different. Now, back in the 1800s, prior to 1923 anyway, it was standard practice for Norwegians to have a three-part name. They had their first name, which was a permanent name that they were given at their baptism. So I've got a little simplified family here that's just got a mom and a dad and a couple of kids to keep it simple. Um, but their first names are always very sex-specific back in Norway. So you don't have Danas like you would in this country sitting wondering is that a male or a female? They don't have names that go both ways in Norway. If their name is Mikkel, you know this person is male. If their name is Anna, you know this person is female. And then the second part of their name was also a permanent name that was followed them throughout their lives, and that was the patronymic name. And patronymic names are basically taking the father's first name and then adding either son or daughter to the name. So if your dad is Lars and you're male, your last name is Larson. So in our family here, we've got Mikkel Larson, Sigriol's daughter, Anna Mikkel's daughter, Lars Mikkelsen, and Anna and Lars, you'll notice, have a have different patronymic names, even though they're brother and sister. One of them's female, so she's Mikkel's daughter. The other one is male, so he's Mikkel's son. And the parents have different patronymic names because their dads had different first names. And so what you may wind up with is two families in the same community or not who have identical patronymics simply because their dads happen to have the same first name. So we've got another household next door. The fathers are both named Mikkel, therefore their children have the same patronymic name. But it doesn't imply any type of kinship necessarily. Now they could very well be related, but the reason that they have that identical patronymic name is simply because their dads happen to have the same first name and nothing more. Now the third part of that name, you've got the first name, you've got the patronymic, you also have a farm name. And this is really more of an address. It's not an inherited last name. So if a family moves from one farm to another, they would change the last name that they were using, just like that. 
So we've got our family here, um, Nicole Larson Beek. They're all living on the Beek farm, so they are entitled to use that last name Beek as a last name. And the children aren't using the name Veek because their dad's using it. The wife, Sigri, she's not using the name Veek because she's married to Mikkel. They're all using that last name simply because they live there. So uh, this causes some confusion for Americans because let's say, which was very common in Norway, you have more than one household living on that farm. There may be two houses or it might just be two families living in the same house. Sometimes that happened too. They're all using the same last name because they're all living on the same farm, but they are not necessarily related. They could be, and often they were related somehow, but it's not the way that we're picturing it. They're not all using that last name because they're families. They're using that last name simply because they live together and nothing more. So if there was a housekeeper living in that house, she would use that last name even though she's not related to the family. So this is just a screenshot of my great-great-grandfather and his ancestors that I took from my ancestry family tree. But you can see that there is not this passage and inheritance of a last name from one generation to the next. They did not do that. Your last name was, your farm name was based on where you lived and nothing more. And you can see that, well, this, a lot of times the patronymic is abbreviated, unfortunately. But, um, oh, I do have a little light here. So you can see this guy here. He is definitely Johannesson because his dad is Johannes. And um, it happens with every generation. They're using that patronymic name, like we got old daughter here. There's her dad. And the farm name isn't necessarily the same from one generation to the next. And it can also be passed from mother to offspring, too. Sometimes you'll see that, like in this case. They went from the wife's farm, and so the son was living on his mother's farm and uses that last name. That was the way that the family was, was moving throughout time. So it's very different from what we're used to in this country. So, of course, when they came to this country, this was kind of a culture shock because last names here were permanent. And husbands and wives had the same last name because they were married, not because they were living together. And children had their father's last names because they were their children, not because they were all living in the same house. So it was a very, very different way of thinking about names once they got here. And they had decisions to make then. You know, sometimes when people landed in this country, they would say, all right, we're going to stick with that patronymic name because it was permanent back in Norway. So we want it to be permanent for us here. So if they were Anderson in Norway, they would say, you know what? We're going to be Anderson here. We're going to skip this farm name. And sometimes they chose a farm name. You know, if they'd been on the same farm for generations, they may have thought of it like a last name the way that we do here. So sometimes they chose a farm name, and that decision wasn't necessarily consistent within families. You might have two brothers move here, and one chooses to be Kittleson, and the other chooses to use that farm name. So you've got families who are related using completely different names. Just as an example, this is one of my ancestors who did just that. The father was, um, when they got married, he was Nordbo and she was Lian, the couple was, and they were living on the same, on, this, on two different farms, but then they got married, and the farm they were living on was actually Staulen when they left Norway. So that was the last name the whole family was using in Norway. And once they got here, on um, the 1860 and 1870 census, I can see it, they're using a patronymic name. But then by 1880, they decided to use a farm name. So even though they were expected to pick a permanent last name, they didn't necessarily do that. And you know, why did they choose to use the patronymic some days and the farm name other days? Your guess is as good as mine <laughs> as to why they would do that. I do think a lot of it has to do with who they were talking to. If you're around people who know you as Kittleson, maybe that's what you're using that day. But they were also inconsistent once they got here on occasion. Um, 
But they did have children who were born in Norway that they brought with them, and their son Thor was very consistent. He used the name Kittelsen in this country the entire time. I've never found a document in this country that has a different last name on it. Um, one thing about those patronymic names, uh, Thor did have sisters, and they were Kittel's daughter back in Norway, but they, Females generally assumed that masculine patronymic in this country. Very seldom will you see someone using Anders daughter or Ol's daughter or Lars daughter here. They usually did, even though they were female, use the son when they were here. But what was interesting about this particular family is that even though Thor's children were all born in Wisconsin, all of his children were born here. None of them had ever been to Norway. They always used Kittelsen, like their father, here while they were living in his house. But then half of them decided, half of the boys decided to go back and use that farm name that their family left behind in Norway. So three of the boys decided to use the name Stolen in this country. I have no idea why they did that. If it's because they decided that there were too many Kittlesons, or if, and they wanted something that stood out a little bit more. I don't know if it's because they said, Kittleson, our dad's not Kittle. Our dad's Thor. If anything, we should be Thorson. I don't know if that motivated them. And my grandma knew these people. And I asked her, I said, why did they do this? And she has no idea. She has no idea why they did that. They just made a different decision. So it was a lot easier to change your name back 120 years ago. So they could just start doing it, and they did. It'd be a lot more complicated to do something like that now. We'd all have to go to court to change our names. But they didn't have to do that. They could just start using a different name. So sometimes you will run into that when you're doing your genealogy. You may find people using more than one last name. And it's not necessarily that they're running from the law or that they have dirty secrets that they're trying to hide, it just might mean that they're Norwegian. <laughs> and that's just what they did. Um, but something that does, um, if you're really, really interested in how Norwegians chose what last name to use, if the person, the patronymic versus the farm name, there was a lady who back in the 1940s wrote her master's thesis on that topic. So if you're just dying to read it, it's online, um, and you can read all of the different, she followed a whole bunch of different families and evaluated how they made those decisions. The one that did stand out to me was that people who were settling in an area in Wisconsin or in the Midwest who were settling among their old neighbors from Norway, they were a lot more likely to pick a farm name than they were a patronymic name because they were Lars from the Bakken farm back in Norway. And then their new neighbors here remembered, oh yeah, you're Lars from the Bakken farm. So he's like, yeah, that's right, that's who I am. And was more likely to stick with that farm name since his, he was around people who that meant something to them too. So that she did find that there was a correlation there. If it was a heavily Norwegian area, especially from the same part of Norway, and they were neighbors before and they're neighbors now, they were a lot more likely to stick with that farm name. But one of the things that we have in this country that they did not have in Norway was a maiden name. Norwegian women didn't change their names because they got married. They changed their names when they moved, which may or may not have anything to do with marriage. So when they got to this country, their children born in this country, I mean, how many times has this happened to you? You have to fill out some paperwork and say, like, what's your mother's maiden name? Well, these kids born in this country, their mothers really didn't have a, a maiden name. She didn't change her name when she got married. She just had a name, and then she changed it when she moved. And so how they answered this question confuses a lot of genealogical researchers. And sometimes it confuses me, because I'll say, now, where in the heck did they come up with that answer? But there are some common threads around that. This happens to be one of my ancestors here. Her name is Sunova Jens Dutterkvam. Sunova was her first name, obviously, and um, she has that patronymic name and a farm name. Um, 
Sometimes when people answered that what's your mother's maiden name question, they would grab that farm name. They would say, well, she was living on that farm. That's where she grew up. That's her maiden name. But they may Americanize it. A lot of people who had farm names that began with a KV in Norway, when they came here, a lot of times they would change it to a QU. I don't know why, but that's a very common thing to do. If you know people with a name like Kwame, Kwaman, Kwali, in Norway it was probably a KV. Sometimes they would give her a patronymic name, but they would usually give the masculine form. Very seldom are you going to see mother's maiden name and it'll say Lars' daughter. It'll probably say Larson. But every now and then on a document, I'll see mother's maiden name and it will say like Johannesson. And I'll say, no, that makes no sense. She was not Johannes' daughter. She, I don't get it. What her dad wasn't Johannes. Well, it'll be her dad's patronymic name is what they put down for the mother's maiden name because in their minds they're thinking, well, maiden name, oh, that's her dad's last name. Got it. And so sometimes they'll put down the uh, mother's father's patronymic name because it was his last name. And sometimes people will come in and say, I think my ancestor was married eight times because look at all these different last names she had. And I'll say, actually, no, she was married once. <laughs> she just lived on three different farms, and that's actually her dad's patronymic. And they just, whoever was answering the question, thought of it a different way because this particular concept just didn't exist in Norway. So in 1923, the Norwegian government did pass a law requiring Norwegian citizens to choose a permanent last name. And a certain amount of that had been coming anyway, as they were getting more contact with cultures where this was the tradition, like the Germans, the Americans, the English, and they were seeing more of that happening. Some families were already doing that, and especially as people were leaving the rural areas and moving more to the cities. A farm name doesn't make sense when you live in a city and you're not living on a farm. So some families had already adopted that permanent last name anyway, but in 1923, they, the Norwegian government said, look, you're picking one and you're sticking with it. And again, just like in this country, they didn't necessarily make the same decision in a family. So you may have a father and his five children picking different last names. So sometimes people will come to me and they'll say, I think they were half brothers because they had different last names. And I'll say, well, hold, hold your horses there. They, that doesn't mean anything. Having a different last name in Norway really doesn't mean what we think it means in this country. It, is, it was a, just a different concept altogether. <clears throat> so one of the things that comes up at the center, people will ask us, okay, that's great, I understand my ancestor had eight last names in his lifetime, so what do I do when I'm trying to write this down in a family tree? What last name do I record them all? Do I just pick one? What do I do? And it's tricky. It really is a hard decision to make because our software is designed and our forms are designed for people who have one last name and it doesn't change. So I do, I will say that the most important thing is to be consistent. Make yourself a set of rules and stick with it. So then you don't have to, so that you understand what you're doing and you can easily explain and show to other people how you made that decision and why you made that decision. As an example, I grabbed one of my ancestor's sisters, my three times great aunt. You know, she was born on the Selsang farm. When she got confirmed, she was living next door on the Kwam farm. And then when she immigrated, she was on the Thorsted farm. So there's a lot of different choices that I could make to decide what last name should I record for her. And, and you've got options, right? There are a lot of people who don't record farm names when they're doing genealogy for their Norwegian ancestry because it could change. It really isn't a, a family name, so to speak. And they will only use the first name and the patronymic, and that's it. Now, uh, most people, I would say, do include a farm name. Um, you could, Selsang would be a logical choice because that's where she was when she was born. So if you're thinking about it as her original name, that would certainly be an option. 
And I think you could make a really good argument for why you would want to use Thorsten, because once she came to this country, that absolutely became their family name. That's the name her brother used. When her children were asked, what's your maiden name? They would say Thorsten. Or would ask what their mother's maiden name was, they would say Thorsten. When they asked her, what's your maiden name? She would say Thorsten. So she thought of it as her family name. But so you could make a decent argument for why that would be a good choice too. And the one that I always go with is this one. And I'm not even going to pretend that I'm right and that I have all the answers. Uh, it's just because I like to be consistent. And when you set yourself some rules, making them easy to follow is important. So I love to include a farm name because that helps us identify where your ancestors were. It really helps you understand the difference between all of the Ole Olsons in your family tree. I have over 70 in mine. There are over 70 men named Ole Olson in my family tree. If I didn't have a farm name attached to it, it'd be awfully hard to keep them all straight. So it helps me keep those people with the same or very similar names apart and tell them apart. And I really do like knowing the different places where they lived because some people were talking to me before I started today asking, do you know where this farm is? Well, I, a lot of times we can find where these farms are. Most of them still exist. So if you want to go back to Norway and see exactly where your family came from, there's a really good chance you can. When Gary and I went to Norway for our honeymoon, I don't know how many we stopped at dozens of different farms to see where our ancestors were because they're still there. The farm names have not changed over centuries. So it is nice to know what all these farms were and where they're located because you can go back and visit them if you want to. It really gives you that connection to your heritage. We're very fortunate that way. I try not to take my Norwegian ancestry for granted because this is something that's so special. A lot of groups don't have this. If you're Irish, the best thing you're probably going to get is what town were they from? Well, or what church were they baptized in? But for a Norwegian, we can actually go back to right where they were growing crops and tilling the land and spending their days. It's pretty amazing. Um, but like I said, I'm not, um, I'm not saying I'm absolutely right that you have to use a farm name, but I really like to do it. And I also like to be consistent and choose the farm name where they were when they were born, where they were baptized, where they were living then, because it's just everybody was born. Not necessarily everybody lives long enough to get confirmed, especially back then, that children die at an alarming rate. So not everybody got married. Not everybody lived long enough to get confirmed or get married. So I always try to choose the baptism. I had a guy actually come into the center just a few months ago, and he said, you know, I'm the opposite of you. I record where they die, because everybody dies. I said, you're right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, I can't really think of a reason why your way is better than mine. They're both, you, you've made a rule. You're being consistent. So he would always go with the last name that they had when they died. And I can appreciate that. The reason I usually go with the first where they were born is not only because everybody's born, but because generally speaking in genealogy, you use the name at birth. You don't record women with their married names. You record them with their name that they had when they were born. So that is why I choose the, the name that they had at birth. Again, I'm not saying that my way is the only way to do it, but I like to choose something that makes it consistent. So how are we doing on time? Can we talk about first names? We're in good shape? All right. Wait a minute, I have a question. Absolutely. What about the fishermen? Did, they, did the fishermen live on parties? They often did. Um, not every, let's see, this is, that's the last name's first names. A, a lot of fishermen did also have a farm name. Um, depending on the era that we're talking about, um, are we looking at like fishermen from the 1800s? Is that? I'm just saying, I know there are a lot of fishermen. There them. were. Um, but a lot of times they also, like during the off season, would be on a farm. Right? You know, you can't fish year round, generally speaking, especially when it's that, that far north. Um, they usually did have a farm name. Um, but we do, I do see for people who um, were in the cities, they abandoned that farm name a lot sooner than people in rural areas. So you'll just, they'll just be Ole Olson 
Lars Larson, there won't be that third chunk to the name. I have a question. Yes, yes. The early immigrants came and they wanted a chunk of property and they registered, in this case, in Milwaukee or Perry Machine. What name did they put down for who owns that chunk of property? They had to pick the up name. They had to pick a name. Because the guy would ask it. Right, right. right. And it, you never know. <laughs> I've seen where they would use the patronymic name when they bought their land. And then the rest of their lives they use their farm name. And it makes it hard to find that land deed because it's not the name you were expecting it to be. But they were wonderfully inconsistent. Consistently inconsistent. They really what about the times weren't there. I've heard cases where the, the people at Ellis Island or wherever they came in couldn't spell their name and so they changed their name for them. It's okay, your name is Brown. It used to be Brittleson, now it's Brown. <laughs> and they decided. That's one of American's favorite genealogy myths. Good. Um, I'm glad to hear that. Yes, the vast majority of immigrants who changed their names made that decision themselves. Now, I'm not saying that there wasn't immense pressure on them from other people to do it. Because it was easier to write. Oh, right, and pronounce, and all sorts of reasons. I, even just a few years ago, I worked with a woman who had an unusual first name, and our boss asked her to use a different one. And this is in the 2000s, you know. She didn't obviously legally change her name, but at work, she had a different name than she had at home. And can you imagine the pressure that these immigrants would have been under from their neighbors and their employers and schools? And one of, actually, one of my staff members at NAGC, she is a Norwegian immigrant and immigrated when she was 10 years old. And at school, her teachers tried to get her to change her name to Sarah and she would not do it. But they did, they're just like, we're gonna call you Sarah. And she said, no, my name is Sulvai, and you will learn to pronounce it, and you will pronounce it correctly. And, but not everybody has that, you know, the strength to do that, and some people wanted to change it too, right? You know, not everybody wants to stand out. Some people wanted to blend in and intentionally change their name to Lewis Lawson instead of Lars Larson, so. Um, it's, it's hard to know exactly what motivated everybody to change it. Some families have a great story about how it happened, and maybe it's true, and others have no idea, have no idea how it happened. And some people may not have a story because most of the family died on ship. Yeah, there were a lot. All we got left is one child who doesn't even speak. Right. Talk. <laughs> so what happened? Right. I mean, apparently, this kid has to get adopted by some other family. Probably. Right, and I wouldn't and be surprised then, if it was a family on the ship. It was just like, right. Well, somebody's got to take they care of it. Give that kid a name. Right. Right. You never. There. So many things could have influenced what name they wind up using here. All right, I'll show you. No. <laughs> yes. I have a question. I saw that Kashkana. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Oh, Kashkana? Yes. <laughs> anyway, in 1850, the relatives that went there, and so I know they're buried there at this one church, but I called the church and they had no record. And I know the lady died of cholera. Did they bury people that had cholera outside? of the cemeteries were not that I'm aware of. Have you ever heard that? No, I haven't, but this is the second 1850 death we've been brought up today, so we'll, we can talk afterwards. We can kind of help you um, try and figure it out. But a lot of the, uh, we were just saying too, that it's 10 years after the church has started, so things were going, but there's a lot of tombstones that have fallen, uh, disarray and things like that. But um, through her organization and ours, um, we can probably help you figure it out. And you tell us the name, you might be related to us anyway. So uh, it's all in our home already. So we can talk afterwards. Yeah, there is a, the earlier the death, the less likely the stone to exist, right? A, 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 did your ancestors stay in Kashkanam or did a lot of the family leave? One of them left, but I mean, there were some that stayed. It, yeah, and the more, um, if they were planning to stay, they were probably more willing to invest in 
better marker for the grave. I'm descended from one of the first people buried in that cemetery, and there's no marker whatsoever. I know that he's there, but I have no idea where. It, his stone is just, if there was ever a stone, it's gone. So, sometimes, yes, Dave. I'll just say to the last year of Gary and Kim, you found your great, great, great grandparents? Yeah, up here at the Queer Church. Yeah, the Queer Church. Yep. So, um, For the first time. Yeah, I didn't know that I had relatives up here, so I, I apologize. I didn't know yeah. my blood's come up this far. <laughs> yeah, most of our family stayed on Pashanam, but Gary did have one pair of ancestors who came up here, so. They, they did move, they were a lot more mobile sometimes than we give them credit for. Um, so anyway, I just talked about the last name traditions, and I think that is something that's really important for people doing their Norwegian genealogy to get their arms around, because it is so different from how we name ourselves today. But there are some interesting first name customs too that are really helpful when you're doing genealogy because Norwegians were remarkably consistent about following these naming customs. And, um, but the first thing I want to talk about is that spelling doesn't count. <laughs> they are, our Norwegian ancestors were incredibly literate. They could all read. That was very, very important for them to learn how to read because they needed to get confirmed. Confirmation is such an important rite of passage for our Norwegian ancestors. And in order to get confirmed, they needed to know how to read. But it is important to remember that they could read print. They couldn't necessarily read handwriting. Because paper was expensive, so even though they could read, they couldn't necessarily write. So a lot of our ancestors could read the Bible beautifully, but if you were to write them a note, would have no idea what it said, because they couldn't necessarily read the script. They could only read movable type. So with that, we don't have necessarily consistent spelling in the church books when it comes to names because, you know, you're very careful about saying, no, it's Dana, D-A-N-A. -A. There's no other letters in it. But our ancestors weren't too worried about that. And they also didn't have to have their driver's license match their passport, match their tax returns. They didn't need that kind of consistency, so it wasn't a priority. So when you're looking at first names and last names and farm names, you do need to be a little bit flexible with how you're expecting the spelling to be because they, they just did not care. It was not a priority and we just have to accept that. I, um, one of the veteran researchers at NAGC, Jerry Paulson, he's been there for decades and the first time I ever heard him speak he was talking about this, and he just looked at the room and he said, you have to get over it. <laughs> and I thought, you're right, Jerry, you do. You just have to get over it. You're going to run into it, and it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Um, so the, generally speaking, the oldest son in the family would be named after his paternal grandfather. And the second son born would be named after the maternal grandfather. So I grabbed some of my ancestors again. Um, oh, look at that girls. The first one will look at the boys. Um, so I, this couple here was just amazing about how they named, they followed the rules to a T. So you can see that Jens here, his father was Johannes, and Kari, her father was Tosten. And so when they had their first son, they named him Johannes Jensen after his grandfather and their second son, they named him Tosten Jensen, because his dad was Jens. They named him at, named the sons after the grandfathers, just like we would expect to do it. And likewise, when they were naming their daughters, the firstborn daughter would be named after her dad's mother. The secondborn daughter would be named after the mother's mother, after the other grandmother. And in true Norwegian fashion, they did the same thing here with their daughters. Suneva and Yertrud are the two grandmas. They named their daughters Suneva Jens' daughter and Yertrud Jens' daughter, just like you would expect them to. And when they had their, the third son was usually named after the father, and the third daughter was usually named after the mother. 
And in the case of this family, they did step away from tradition a tiny bit. They named their fourth daughter Kari rather than their third daughter. But their third son was named Jens, just like we were expecting it to be. So what this means is that cousins often have the same name because everybody's naming their firstborn son after grandpa. So now all of a sudden we have a whole bunch of boys with the same name. And this couple had at least six grandsons with the same first name. And they had at least five granddaughters with the same first name because their children were following the traditions. And so you can get a, a community with everybody has the same name because of this naming tradition. Names become very, very common in different regions. started doing genealogy, I assumed this one died. I just figured, oh, she must have died but before the other one was born. Otherwise, why would they do that? And I completely ignored her. Turns out she immigrated to America, had a whole bunch of descendants. I had no, I stopped looking for her because I just figured she didn't survive. And I was wrong. <laughs> she had many descendants, lived in Iowa. And so it's important to keep that in mind. They often had children with the same name at the same time who grew into adulthood that was not unheard of at all. But I wasn't completely wrong. When a child dies, it was very, very common for um, <clears throat> Norwegians to name another child 
after the one they just lost. And so in this case, actually I did lie to you a little bit. The oldest girl did die. It was this one that I thought had died before 1848. Because in 1848, they lost their daughter. And they had another one that year and named her after the one they had just lost. So they had three daughters with the exact same name in this family. And the older girl lived to be 12 years old, so you know the family has a lot of memories of her. So can you imagine talking about, well, Ingeborg, 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 you know, how do you even know which one you're talking about? It's so strange to us, but to them, that's what you did. You kept that oldest girl's memory alive by naming the next one after her, and that was how they honored that memory. Something else that might seem a little bit strange to us is that if the father dies when the mother was pregnant, it was very, very common for them to name the baby after the father if it was a boy, regardless of birth order. If she was pregnant and lost her husband, she would name her baby after her husband. And if it was a girl, she would make it a feminized version of whatever his name was. That's what we get names like Olina, Larsina, Jensina because they've taken a man's name and made it feminine. So this is one from Gary's family, uh, particularly tragic. The husband and wife um, had several children, and you can see in 1866, a lot of them died, they, they got cholera. So the husband died in 1866, and two of the children died in 1866. And the mother was pregnant later that year, she had another child, and I mean, they took it all the way. She named her Johanna after the daughter who died, named her Hansina after the father who died, and then added Godfredina to her name to honor the other brother who had died. So it was very, very common for them to be using those names and honoring people who they had lost. This is the one that's really weird to most Americans. It was very common for widows or widowers to name the first child in their next marriage after their last spouse. I'm going to put like this. Well, you see, the number of bottles of white out, people have to use that as a mouse nest. Yeah, so this is some of my ancestors, actually. This couple had four children, and the husband died in 1845. So the wife remarried, and the first son in her second marriage, born just a few years later, she named after her first husband. It wasn't after either of the grandfathers. He was named after her first husband, and that was very, very common. She wasn't a weirdo. That was very common, that was expected, that you would name, if you remarried and were still young enough to have children, that you would rename the first child of the same sex as your previous spouse after that spouse. So sometimes these naming traditions did follow the Norwegians to this country. Uh, this is again my great-great-grandfather. He did name his first son, born in Wisconsin, Nels, after his dad. And this is something from Gary's family, actually. A lot of times they would try to follow those traditions, but they would Americanize those names. So we have this couple, oh, go back here, push more button. This couple here, Oli and Brita, they were both born in Norway. They got married here in, the, in Wisconsin. And their first four children were named after the four grandparents, Lars and Ingeborg, the children were named Louis and Isabella after the grandparents. And then Anders and Brita, those children were named Andrew and Betsy after those. So they were still using that tradition, but making it sound more English or more American by picking a slightly different name. And this family actually did have followed the custom of naming a child after one they lost. They had two Lewises. One Lewis died as a little boy. So the next one, the next boy they had, they named Lewis after his older brother. And this absolutely does help with genealogy. I always picture my ancestors following all the rules, but I remember they might not. They don't always follow all the rules, but they, they were so amazingly consistent. It really is amazing how they would. So I assume that the first child was named after a grandparent, and oftentimes that will help me find 
the grandparents I was looking for. If I can see that they had named their first son Oli, I figure, you know, I bet his grandpa was named that and try to piece it all together and figure it out. I have found older children in the family. Like I'll be looking at the 1865 census and I'll say, none of these kids has the same name as one of the grandpas because I can see the parents' patronymic names. And I'll say, I bet there's older kids that aren't in the house anymore. They're just gone. They've moved away. And I found them just by assuming that there was a rule that was being followed. I just couldn't see it because they weren't all together. And I have found a, a first spouse when that oldest child wasn't named after one of the grandparents. I'll say, now why did they name this kid Thomas? Oh, it's because she was married before and that was her first husband. And so I have if they're, if it, I assume that they're going to follow the rules and then see if I can find more family members. Sometimes they don't. They don't always follow them, but I do, I have definitely used that. And like I said, people definitely broke from tradition. They weren't laws. It was just a custom. So especially if the wife's family was a little more prominent, they may choose to name their first children after her parents instead of his parents. They may flip-flop that. And not everybody followed the rules. Sometimes people just started naming their kids stuff. And I always look at that and think, now why aren't you following the rules? <laughs> but it, I was always amazed at how consistent that people did do that back then. And in fact, I was telling Gary about one on the way up here. His, and I need to find that baptism record and just show it to you because you'll look at it and you'll see, you've got to be kidding me. People didn't really do that, but they did. Um, there was a couple, it was John Olson and his wife, I don't remember her first name, but she was Ol's daughter. So their dads had the same first name, and their firstborn children were actually a set of twins. Both boys, both named Ole Johnson. <laughs> Why they did that, I don't know. Well, I do know, they were following the rules. So not only did they have the same name, they had the same birthday. And luckily, one of the boys immigrated to Montana, so I can tell them apart. But <laughs> in the records, you would never know which was which. They had the same name and the same birthday and the same parents, but they would actually do that. It really did happen. Did they give one a DE and a DY yet? You know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's a really good question. One had to be born first. Yeah. They don't come out at the same time. Yeah, I don't know. They probably had names. Yes, and it was very common. They had names too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The same name. You got yeah, right, right. It was very, very common for kids to have nicknames. Like they, if they had different hair colors, no. they would, um, you know, call one like white and black. If one had dark hair, one had light hair. Um, Big and Little was a common one when the brothers and sisters had the same name. And it wasn't sometimes like Big Ole and Little Ole. Big Ole wasn't necessarily smaller. He was just older. <laughs> so you will see that sometimes too. Um, or they will call them like older and younger too. But they did, yeah, a lot of times have nicknames to differentiate between kids with the same name. Yes. And Ole and Ole A and Ole W. When they came here? I, I guess that was it, yeah, but I know we always have to figure out whose great grandparents was only W and whose was only A. <laughs> because they were brothers. <laughs> and, yeah, and I do see that um, sometimes Norwegians will just pick a random middle initial if they want to use that patronymic last name. You know, they'll be Ole Halverson. Well, there really normally wouldn't be a middle name there to have a middle initial. So sometimes they would just pick a letter because all the Americans had middle initials. Well, I'll just, I'll be Ole J. Halverson. And we all have to stand around and wonder what the heck was the J for? It, you know, because it doesn't necessarily stand for something. Gary has an ancestor who always went with a middle initial. He was born in Wisconsin. He's Albert J. Anderson. For the life of me, I have no idea what that J stands for. And it may just be that he wasn't given a middle name and thought he should have an initial. 
And now maybe I will discover that he did have a middle name someday, but I, do you have any idea? Your dad doesn't want How would I know? This is a word. <laughs> Right back, I, like I said, the greatest thing about me marrying her is that my family, she brought, she knows more about my family than I do. And then the joke is that what are, we're our own six cousins. Yeah, so that, so if you want to know, she's very lucky she married me because my family is many of these case studies, uh, <laughs> case studies here. So I, I made yeah, her when, like, a, when a client comes in and says, I want to know, do you start with like, Card and then you just kind of slide them around rather than say, okay, let's get the rack and let's just start throwing it in because you're going to be wrong by the time you get to the third tier. Or you might be wrong. You might be wrong. Um, we usually use software, so then you just delete. <laughs> or, I'm still at the card stage. I don't want to keep over here. Well, there are people who do like to use paper and do stuff like that. It's easier for them to visualize how everybody's connected. That is the nice thing about Family Tree software is it will draw those charts for you. So you can see, you know, who's descended from which brother and it'll draw it all out. Or you can just see who the ancestors are. So I really do advocate for the software. It helps you keep everything connected the way it should. And the longer you do research, the you will eventually find people who are connected to you in more than one way. Right, but between marriages and you will definitely find people who are related to you in multiple ways. It just happens. Small, small towns, there wasn't a lot to choose from. So you'd have sisters marrying brothers and you have, that happens a lot. So. Not actual brothers and sisters marrying. No, no that seldom happens. Well, I have this, this very guy out there, you do have room in the audience. I know where she's like going with this, so yes. It's brothers from one family. Very sisters from another, or cousins, you know, where you've got a brother and you've got a couple gets married and then their cousins marry each other too, and so it just, you, you will run into that. Did anyone have any other questions about names or? I was just going to make a comment when you said that a child passed away, they named it. My dad was named after his older brother that passed away at three years old. Yeah. They were both named Harlan. Yeah, one of, my, one of my colleagues too, she was named after her older sister mm -hmm. who died as a child. So it, in it our generation, it sounds a little foreign, but not that long ago, it was still a relatively <clears throat> common concept to do that. And using family names is something we don't see a lot of young people doing anymore. You know, I, I look at it and I think, oh wow, you're obviously a fan of that TV show. You just named your kid that. And but 50 years ago, it was usually digging names out of the family tree. That was what you did to name your children. So, except for us, we have Daniel after her dad, Isabella. Uh, oh, she actually was in the Tillo family, and then uh, Michalina which is out of the woman whose husband, two girls died on the way over here. Uh, her name was Nicolina, so we do that, but yes, of course we, we, do we see what we are coming from too. Right. So. Another person that had a nightmare around here was a local mailman. He was holding <laughs> all this mail in this box and he was fighting, who are these people? So even he changed some names and or initials just to say, yeah. keep the, the, the route one, two, three, four, and five. Yeah, and he probably had a code on there and to know who was who. Yeah. Remember, Dave, we found that picture of the people in their mailbags and the five horses? Duh. Route one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. yeah, I have a feeling that a lot of people after time said, you know what, that whole Olson thing is not working for me because that's what everybody else does too. You know, I'm going to have to go back to that farm name. Well, a quick thing though, a lot of things that changed during the Civil War. Um, a lot of the immigrants came over here and fought. And my family got coming I mean, Thor Kinglands or something. There was like 20 of them. Well, they, yeah, they decided to use that farm name yep. to separate so, instead of using the patronymic because there were so many, yeah, forces. So, um, I just want to say thank you for letting us come here today. Uh, Dave and Ruth, I want to give you guys a uh, round of applause. Hang around here for a little bit. We have some stuff here if you're interested in. Also, 
at this brainstorming, the way things are going, I think you guys should plan a bus trip down to Costco to Perry sometime. We're hoping this, the festivals might be a little different next year, because um, the date's like in the middle of the week. When you say the festivals, you mean set in my celebrating in Stoke. So, you know, yeah. set in my here. Because yeah. next year it's a Wednesday, so you could pick different weekends. So, <laughs> Really, a lot of people from Stoke area would probably come up here to do, you know, check out stuff, and then probably a lot of you guys would Enjoy. come down and check out how, uh, how we party down there. But uh, it's uh, it's just something else. So yeah, we'll be uh, hanging around here. But thank you everyone for your your time, and you're always welcome. Reach out to us uh, through the day of the roof too. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna be come on down to Cashback Ferry, and we'll show you around the churches and everything like that. So uh, thank you everyone. Thank you.